Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laura Cavers. I am the reader advisor here at New Canaan Library. Welcome to New Canaan Library's author talk with Alan Audens, who will discuss his book, General John A. Rawlins, Rawling, No Ordinary Man. The book to be discussed tonight has received accolades from internationally renowned historians. Princeton history professor James McPherson, Lincoln scholar Harold Holzer, and writer Peter Cousin. They have all called the book a definitive biography, a masterpiece with formidable sleuthing, and that it is as enjoyable to the casual history buff as it is, to the, as it is instructive to the serious scholar. No Ordinary Man is a solid, splendid biography that reveals an alarming gap in the Civil War history. Alan J. Audens is Professor Emeritus of Counselor Education and Supervision at Northern Illinois University. He worked as a psychologist at several university counseling centers. He is also a past president of the Manuscript Society. He has had a lifelong interest in the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln. He has published a number of books, and this is his first book on the Civil War. Welcome, Al. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, you. Wanna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to thank uh, you, Laura, and the staff of the New Canaan Library for inviting me to speak to you about General John Rawlins, uh, the subject of my new biography, uh, which I understand uh, people can order through the Elm Street Bookstore in your fine town. Uh, hint, hint. Laura, I've lost your sound. Somebody muted you, I guess. Can you hear me? All right, thank you, Zuhair. I, I uh, got your message, but uh, Laura's voice is muted. Uh, Laura, your screen has frozen up. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, proceed. Uh, so let me go back and thank uh, the staff at uh, New Canaan Library uh, and to give a shout out to uh, Laura Cavers who's helped organize this webinar. Uh, so kind of let me begin at the beginning. Um, what I will do today uh, in this webinar is to give you uh, some glimpses from this biography. Um, I'll start out talking first a little bit about who John Rawlins was and why a biography about him. Um, John Rawlins was born in the lead mining region of far Northwest Illinois in 1831. And, and that might surprise some folks uh, who are unfamiliar with the uh, geography out here. 
Um, the uh, northwest area of Illinois, southwestern Wisconsin, and northeastern Iowa contain some of the largest lead ore deposits in the world. And the town of Galena, Illinois, named after uh, the lead sulfide ore, uh, gets the claim as General Rawlins's uh, hometown. Uh, despite an impoverished uh, upbringing, uh, John Rawlins got some schooling, uh, even had uh, a semester or so of higher education schooling at the Mount Morris uh, cemetery, uh, Seminary. Uh, after his, his uh, few semester or semester and a half at uh, the seminary, he uh, got some uh, uh, tutoring under the tutelage of a lawyer in Galena, read law, uh, and uh, prior to the Civil War was a rising star in democratic politics in that part of the state. Uh, and it was in Galena, uh, while he was working as an attorney uh, for the Grant Leather Store there on Main Street, that he met Ulysses Grant, who had moved there in April 1860 to take a job in his father's leather goods store. Uh, at that time in his life, Grant uh, had experienced some hard time. Um, he'd left uh, the military under a cloud, uh, had some years as a hard scrabble farmer, had some failed business ventures, and now was in Galena uh, getting a hand from his father to get back uh, financially and emotionally onto his feet. Um, after the Civil War broke out, uh, Grant had tried to get a commission uh, to lead a regiment and also to get his brigadier generalship, which he finally got in August 1861. And immediately he reached out to John Rawlins in Galena uh, with an invitation to join his staff as the assistant adjutant general. Uh, Rawlins soon became indispensable to Grant, moving up in rank and responsibility to eventually become Grant's chief of staff, chief of staff of the army, and secretary of war in Grant's cabinet. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rollins served only six months in that capacity as Secretary of War. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Before he passed away from tuberculosis. Well, I can at least just hear. Uh, Rollins played important roles uh, as Grant's advisor, friend, and as the staff person who helped administer and coordinate America's most complex military organization prior to World War II. Um, Rollins was a major figure in his day. Uh, he was beloved by many, respected by his fellow officers, yet Rollins was always the subordinate who stood behind and to the right of Grant. Uh, Rollins, kept a low profile. He never sought out the limelight, uh, preferring basically to serve his commander in chief. Okay. So even though he kept a low profile, um, uh, Rollins was ever loyal to Grant. He desired to help Grant succeed. And he could tell that Grant was destined for greatness. He could see greatness in Grant right from the beginning. And along with all those attributes, John Rawlins was patriotic to the core. Yet, unfortunately, little is known about him today. When I decided to write Rawlins' story, I wanted actually to do a little more than just make him better known to the public. It was time to give Rawlins his due. Uh, consider, for example, how many biographies of Grant have appeared in the last 20 years quite a few. It seems like one comes out every six months. 
But the only serious biography of John Rawlins was published back in 1916. I also wanted to present a balanced view of Rawlins. Uh, if he's portrayed at all, it is usually as the nag who had to keep Grant sober or as the brains who was responsible for at least half of Grant's military and political success. Uh, there was an old joke back in the day that, uh, that went, if you kicked Grant in the head, you dislodge Rollins's brain. But of course, uh, Rollins as the nag and Rollins as the, uh, the brains behind Grant are unfair to both Grant and Rollins. So a, a more equitable and fairer treatment of General Rollins was in order. Well, to give you some perspective on Rollins tonight, I'll provide some glimpses of him as a rising Democrat in Galena, as Grant's indispensable staff officer, and as Secretary of War in Grant's, in Grant's cabinet. Uh, I'll also give you my opinion of what was Rollins's most overlooked attribute, basically how he grew as a man while working with Ulysses Grant. So first, the rising Democrat in Galena, Illinois. Um, John Rawlins inherited his father's politics. Uh, old man Rawlins was a Jacksonian Democrat through and through. And his son, John, was a true believer in Stephen Douglas, who was Lincoln's main opponent in the 1860 presidential election. Well, Southern Democrats of that day were pro-slavery and opposed to restrictions on uh, it spread into the territories at that time. Uh, Northern Democrats were concerned about the trouble that abolitionists might stir up and were generally in support of the Dred Scott decision handed down in 1857 uh, that denied Blacks citizenship rights. Uh, James Buchanan was the president, a Democrat, who preceded uh, Lincoln in the White House. And uh, when Southern states began seceding in the winter of 1860 to 1861, Buchanan shrugged his shoulders and said really there was nothing he could do about it. <clears throat> After Major Robert Anderson surrendered Fort Sumter, the citizens of Galena wrestled with the question of how to respond to the looming military confrontation. A town meeting was hastily called and held at the Galena Courthouse in mid-April 1861. Um, Citizen Grant was in attendance. He attended the meeting along with his brother Orville. Uh, the congressman, the, the Republican congressman in Galena and uh, a very powerful uh, political figure in Washington by the name of Elihu Washburn was given first crack at speaking to, the, to this audience at the courthouse. After Rawlins had his say, uh, after Washburn had his say, Rawlins was called upon to speak for the Democrats. And I'd like to share with you an excerpt from my book that describes this momentous speech, one that became fixed in Grant's mind and no doubt motivated Grant to select Rollins as his first choice for his staff. So here's my description of John Rollins's momentous speech before the citizens in the courthouse. Galena's Republican Congressman Elihu Washburn was barely seated before the crowd began a rhythmic chant. Rollins, Rollins. The Republican had had his say, and now Galena's leading Democrat should have his. He threaded his way up to the platform where a tiny island of space was reserved for the speakers. He sized up his audience as they took measure of him. They saw a live lawyer 
with raven black hair and pale face alternating between expressions of fury and determination. John Rollins was about to give the speech that not hell, high water, or hostile black Republicans could prevent. Rollins started slowly. His full bodied voice enveloped the hall. He started with a history lesson. <clears throat> Listeners who were in this room six months before recollected how Rollins, as a self-assured debater, used a similar approach when confronting Alan Fuller. Now, Rollins hearkened the audience back to the sacrifices made by the patriots of the revolution and the blood they had shed to defend their country. He reminded everyone about the American way Minority factions yield peaceably to the opinion of the majority, even on contentious issues like the Missouri Compromise and Kansas-Nebraska Act. He spoke for 45 minutes. The great speech seemed to build on itself to gather momentum and the audience was carried along. Rollins was reaching a crescendo. Now was no time for partisanship the moment required unanimity. Leaning into the audience, Rollins's voice quavered with emotion. I have been a Democrat all my life, but this is no longer a question of politics. It is simply country or no country. I have favored every honorable compromise, but the day for compromise is past. He had his listeners in an emotional clinch. In anticipation of a rousing conclusion, many began to lift themselves from their chairs. Only one course is left for us, he intoned, pausing brief, briefly for effect. We will stand by the flag of our country and appeal to the God of battles. That brought them all to their feet. They cheered for Rollins, they cheered for the Union, for the flag, and for Major Robert Anderson. It was the night when, quote, the courthouse rang with such a tempest of applause as was never before heard within its walls. Well, because Rollins advocated aggressive military intervention to bring the seceded states back into the Union, he was considered a war Democrat. And this is kind of in contrast to other Northern Democrats who would come to oppose the military draft, Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus and waging war for the emancipation of blacks. Well, I'd like to move on to the next topic and that's an intervention that Rollins performed that I think greatly helped Grant. Uh, and uh, this was an intervention that Rollins uh, performed as he was uh, chief of staff for Grant during the Vicksburg campaign. And this was a, during an especially tense time uh, for Grant uh, during the war. <clears throat> In the winter of 1863, uh, these are the months uh, generally February and March, Grant's army was stuck outside of Vicksburg while he grappled with how to conquer this strategic city on the Mississippi. And his troops were basically bogged down. Grant was frustrated in attempts to find a suitable route through the swamps and channels that protected Vicksburg. There was growing impatience at the North with Grant. There, was also, there were also newspaper reports unfavorable to Grant. One in particular uh, was published in the New York Times in February, 1863, when a reporter um, alerted the public that there were epidemics of illness among the troops that were bogged down in the mud and, uh, and uh, moisture outside of Vicksburg. 
There were also rumors that Grant was drinking, that members of his staff were drinking, and the bad press and the dire reports were making Lincoln and his cabinet very nervous. If Grant was indeed about to fail and things looked bad for him, there was a rival of his in the wings who was all too ready and all too eager to take his place. And that was General John McLernand. McLernand. McLernand was a corps commander in Grant's army and, and uh, he had been uh, a powerful democratic politician in Illinois and well-connected uh, throughout the state and well-known to Lincoln. And uh, McLernand had tried before to try to usurp power and uh, was also responsible for planting some of these negative rumors about Grant that were finding their way now into Washington, DC. Well, with all the nervousness in the White House and in the cabinet, in early April, 1863, Secretary of War Stanton sent his assistant, Charles Dana, to Vicksburg, ostensibly on a mission to check on the distribution of pay intended for the troops. But everyone knew that Dana was really coming to investigate all these negative rumors and to send a report back to Stanton. And really, if that was a negative report, this could doom Grant and his military career. And lo and behold, John Rawlins stepped in and he would save the day. Grant's staff was not happy about having a mole planted in their midst. In fact, one of the staff members even suggested that when Dana showed up, he ought to be grabbed and thrown into the Mississippi River. But that was not the approach that Rawlins thought would be helpful at this point. Instead of confronting Dana or blocking his efforts, Rawlins took the exact opposite approach. He welcomed Dana. He made him privy to the discussions then taking place for capturing Vicksburg, gave him a special seat at the mess table and made every effort to be as transparent as possible. The approach worked. Dana was won over and he sent back glowing reports to Washington and Grant's plan for Vicksburg would succeed just three months later. This was a tremendous success. And I think Rollins needs to be patted on the back for helping, uh, for helping Grant get through what could have been a very tense time. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about uh, a very, uh, uh, a, a little known role that Rollins played while serving as Grant's Secretary of War. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, Rollins was only secretary for about uh, six months. Um, by the time he joined the cabinet, he was extremely ill and weak uh, given, his, uh, tuber given the tuberculosis that was uh, wrecking his body. Uh, it had not been Grant's plan originally to invite Rawlins into the cabinet. Uh, Grant originally had planned to give Rawlins command of the Department of Arizona. Uh, he hoped, Grant hoped, that by putting Rawlins out into the uh, dry air uh, and elevation of the Southwest, that this would have a good effect on his lungs. But Rollins really did not want that post. He thought he deserved and uh, that it was more appropriate for him to serve as Secretary of War. Well, one of the things he did as, as War Secretary was to play a pivotal role in launching the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. <coughs> Excuse me. 
As Secretary of War, Rawlins had to make sure that the bridge complied with federal regulations so as not to impede vessels navigating the East River or to interfere with ship traffic to and from the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Also, the span of the bridge had to be a proper height above the river's flood tide. Um, despite his illness that was now ravaging him, Rollins studied the plans carefully, uh, met with um, a number of individuals who were involved in the planning and the engineering, and uh, he studied the plans and its location, and in June 1869, gave his approval for construction to begin. Well, let me uh, talk also about uh, what, in my opinion, was perhaps John Rawlins's foremost legacy. And I think, unfortunately, historians have overlooked this point uh, as far as Rawlins is concerned. So let me share this with you. Um, although we don't know Rawlins's exact attitudes before the war toward African Americans. As a Democrat and supporter of Stephen Douglas, they couldn't have been very enlightened. Uh, although Stephen Douglas was not a supporter of slavery, he was also um, an out and out racist. Uh, he firmly believed uh, that uh, Blacks are uh, genetically inferior and uh, the Democrats in Rawlins's congressional district uh, were firm supporters of the Dred Scott decision and, uh, and keeping citizenship uh, rights out of the hands of Blacks. Well, what historians have overlooked is the significant growth Rawlins underwent to become a supporter of expanded constitutional rights for African Americans and his support while a cabinet member for the insurrectionists in Cuba who were attempting to gain independence from their Spanish oppressors. Uh, I uh, talk at some length in the book about um, that era of after the Civil War that we know as Reconstruction. Um, Supporters of President Andrew Johnson worked overtime to keep Blacks subjugated. Um, others like John Rawlins were ready uh, and more willing to grant uh, Blacks constitutional rights that had been not, that had been not been denied to them by that uh, Supreme Court Dred Scott decision. Although I don't have time tonight to go into details, I devote a portion of a chapter in my book to discussing Rawlins's important platform speech that he gave in Galena on June 21st, 1867. In that speech, he advocated for among other things that constitutional rights be extended to former slaves as well as conferring the right to, black, uh, to vote on all black males. Well, let me stop here. I see that we have a few questions. But Al, you, you carried the show. Thank you. Well, thank you. And <laughs> I wanted to make sure uh, my intent was to do about a half an hour talking uh, on yeah. a monologue and then make sure we have some time so that uh, those with questions. Get yes. A so we are. We're going to open it up to questions. If anybody does have a question, please put it in the Q and A area, which you can see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I see we already do have some questions here, uh, but please do um, keep adding them uh, as we go along. Let, uh, let Let me address one question that you posed to me before we got on the air. And that okay. was, how did I come to this topic and why a book on Rollins and how did yeah. it get researched? 
So yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that as the questions come in. Okay. Um, as you had mentioned earlier, I've, I've had an interest in the Civil War for almost all my life. Um, and we live just down the road, about an hour and a quarter from Galena. So it's a town I've been in and visited more times than I could ever relect, uh, recollect. And I'll even share a personal item. My wife and I honeymooned in Galena and we stayed at the DeSoto House Hotel that I talk about in the book. Okay? Uh -huh. uh, and I was in Galena on a visit some years ago, now maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And I always used to go into a bookstore on Main Street called Main Street Fine Books and Manuscripts. Uh, and the proprietor is an old friend of mine by the name of William Butts. And we were talking and Bill said to me, he said, hey, why don't you write? And he knew I'd written a few articles on the Civil War. And he said to me, he said, hey, why don't you write a, a biography of John Rawlins? It's long overdue, a new one. And I said, I'll think about it, Bill. Well, I took that task on and to research the book, as you asked about, uh, I did a number of things. I uh, went down to Springfield, Illinois to the Abraham Lincoln Library, which has some documents uh, about Rollins. I went to the Chicago History Museum, which has a Rollins collection. I went out to Cheyenne, Wyoming wow. uh, to, to uh, read uh, transcripts of Rollins letters. And also in Galena at the public library, they have copies of all of the newspapers of the day. So I was able to go back into the Galena newspapers and uh, read firsthand what people were saying. So those are, those are just some examples of what I was doing to, to, get, the, to, to get myself uh, uh, situated where I could write knowledgeably about Rollins. And how wonderful that you were also uh, to go to places where he yes. had been and Down to the, see the environment, see everything, the get the words of the people there that were talking yeah. about him. Uh, how wonderful, the, that's part of the fun. Down to the Grant Presidential Library at Mississippi State University. It's another example of where my travels took me. Well, so, let's us get uh, on with some of the other questions. Uh, Peter Bergen is interested in knowing about Lee's equivalent of John Rollins. How did he perform versus Rollins? Do you have um, um, an answer for that? You know, that would have taken me into a whole different direction. It's an excellent question and people have looked at that. And Mr. Bergen, what I'm going to do is refer you to a book uh, called The Right Hand of Command, um, which came out a few years ago uh, in which the author whose name escapes me at the moment, but the book is called The Right Hand of Command. And the author of that book uh, is an historian who's taken a look at how various uh, commanders, Grant, Lee, and Sherman, and McClellan, for example, use their staffs. Uh, and he goes into great detail on that. Unfortunately, I can't speak about uh, Lee's chief of staff uh, so I'm going to have to defer you and refer you to uh, the right hand of command. I, I just looked up on our computers here. So the right hand of command, use and disuse of personal staffs yes. um, in the Civil War. That was written by, by, written by R. Stephen Jones just to let, if Mr. Bergen wants to look for that. Yes, Stephen Jones, uh, he's at a, a uh, university in Oklahoma, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. All right, so the next question, Quentin Moore was asking, uh, was Rollins' personal life happy? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, the uh, quick answer is, well, you, you should have asked him. But frankly, I think Rollins 
uh, experienced a lot of heartache in his life. Uh, his he grew up in an impoverished situation as a charcoal burner. Uh, they cut the wood to make the charcoal that was used to uh, smelt the ore that produced the lead. Um, he, his first wife died after five years of marriage because she, she succumbed to tuberculosis and obviously passed it along to him. Um, he married a second time, uh, which I think was happy for him, but his second wife had some difficult pregnancies. Rollins uh, tuberculosis began to be evident in October 1863, and he fought that for the rest of his life. Um, I think he was happy with what he accomplished, but when you read the book, you'll see some quotes I have in there uh, from Rollins in which he admits to his wife that the uh, photographs of himself seem to show him in a very depressed mood. Um, he would say, for example, gee, I look depressed, but I don't know if I feel that bad on the inside. Hmm. So the next two questions are actually kind of the same. One's from Ken Hack and the other is actually from your classmate in college. And I'm probably going to say his name incorrectly. Zuhar Sudan. They both ask how if Rollins and Lincoln had met. Did they meet, um, talk, have meetings? Yes, uh, Rollins met Lincoln several times. And uh, the first time, um, well, um, the, most, the first time that really meant anything was in July, 1863, right after Rollins, uh, right after Grant captured Vicksburg. And uh, I told you that there was that tension with General McClernand. I, I think you may remember that. Well, uh, McClernand in May 1863 and in the next month, June, overstepped his bounds and Grant fired him, uh, which, was a which was risky because as, as I said before, McClernand had a lot of very powerful uh, connections. And after Vicksburg fell, Grant sent Rollins to Washington to meet with Lincoln and the cabinet to do a couple of things. One was to gauge the feeling in the White House as to, you know, what did they think now that McClernand got fired? Are they angry at Grant? Uh, do they think McClernand uh, needs to be avenged and so forth. And the second reason is he wanted somebody to represent him in Washington who could give a good description of what went on in Vicksburg and how Vicksburg was captured. And Rollins, of course, could do that and speak very highly uh, of his uh, commanding officer. Um, so that was uh, one time where where Rollins, and probably the most important time that Rollins uh, met Lincoln. You know, it's a great question. I haven't counted up the number of times that uh, Rollins was in uh, Rollins was in Lincoln's presence, but th th there were several times when they when they met. Okay, um, I got a little note that the library is getting loud, so I muted myself, but. Um, there is another question from Charles Salmons. He asks, didn't Rollins have an ad adversarial relationship with General Sherman? Wow, the, yes, that's a great question and thanks for asking it. Um, for a long time, they were quite close. And let me talk a little bit about what trans what transpired to kind of drive a wedge between them. Um, 
There were two things. Let me t- let me take one, and I could talk about both, uh, but I it might take up a little too much time. Um, the w- one incident that caused a uh, rift between Rollins and Sherman was Sherman's decision to take his army on the march to the sea. And uh, Sherman left Atlanta in, I think it was November, 1864, uh, and uh, marched from Atlanta down to Savannah. And this uh, decision by Sherman was, um, was met with some skepticism by a number of people. Although Grant gave his okay, Grant indeed had his worries because Sherman would be on his own, uh, cut loose from a supply line. And Sherman was also taking the, uh, the best troops with him, uh, the cream of the crop, so to speak, leaving General George Thomas with kind of the leftovers. And Rollins was worried about this and expressed that worry. But Rollins was not the only one who was concerned. Even Lincoln uh, wondered if Sherman could pull this off. Well, Sherman accused Rollins of going behind his back against, uh, uh, going behind his back uh, and talking to the administration against him. I don't have any proof that Rollins did that. But I do offer an explanation in the book that would require a little bit more time to go into than we have here. Uh, Sherman never forgot. However, I think Rollins was right. And one of the things I do is to provide some ammunition for that by quoting at length from General John Schofield, who was Rollins's um, predecessor as Secretary of War and uh, was a well-regarded general for many, many years. So you can read what I said uh, uh, in the book about how Schofield uh, supported Rollins for his skepticism about uh, Sherman's march. What Rollins really wanted was for, for Sherman to turn his attention and first destroy Hood's army and then go on the march. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to have uh, Mary Manning has had her hand up for quite some time. And Mary, you can type your question into the Q&A or I can, I'm going to allow you to talk. I'm going to turn you on if you want to. You need Hello? To, are you there, Mary? Hi, can you hear me or no? I, I can, can hear, hear you. Yeah, I just want to say I'm uh, Rollins's great, great, great grandson. Oh, I'm very wow. excited about this book. And he's been a real um, exciting person in our family history. You know, we went, we see his um, statue in Washington, D.C. Yes. So I'm very excited about this. Well, you know, it's interesting because I did a talk for the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop back in August. And one of the uh, participants was uh, Wade Rollins, who was uh, a great, 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 great grand nephew of John Rollins. And uh, Wade was reading the book and was really happy uh, that uh, the book had come out and he was enjoying it. And how are you now related to uh, John Rollins? Well, my mother was a maiden named Emily Sheehan. And so I think Sheehan was, um, had friends with Rollins. And um, anyway, so my, my um, yeah, so I was, my mother's great grandfather, or great, great grandfather was uh, Rollins. And um, yeah, through the Sheehan, um, Yes, one of John Rollins, John Rollins' sister married a Sheehan. I, I think his, his, one of his 
daughter is also married to Sheehan, and there was some, there might have been a little bit of um, yes, right, yes, inbreeding or <laughs> to a small extent. Uh, it was on the level. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad. Uh, uh, I'm glad you're able to um, uh, give us that information. And have you have you visited Galena, by the way? I, I have never been there, but I, is there is there any stuff there that um, mentions Rollins or is there stuff to see there um, with respect to Rollins? Not a lot. Um, there is a Rollins Road in Guilford Township that goes through the old Rollins property, but uh, there's really... There's really no statue to Rollins. There's no, there's nothing in the museum in town, uh, nothing much in the museum in town uh, about Rollins. Uh, so if you go there, it's, it's really to steep yourself more into the history of uh, Ulysses Grant. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. We have two more questions. Um, that was a nice, uh uh familial <laughs> that was fun absolutely yeah uh okay so another question why would the secretary of the army be involved in the brooklyn bridge design approval process well as i mentioned uh it had to be you had to make sure that uh, uh, the span of the bridge was high enough so that ships would not get hung up on it uh, and that uh, it wouldn't impede river traffic. So um, uh, it really needed the approval. It, be, because there were these military aspects to it, it needed the uh, Secretary of War approval. And then um, another question is from Quentin Moore. I believe that Grant did not give Rollins his due in Grant's autobiography. If I've got this right, can you discuss, was Grant oversensitive about the credit that Rawlins might get for Grant's successes? Yes and yes. Um, Rawlins, uh, Rawlins really was given extremely short shrift in, Grant, in Grant's famous memoirs, his two volume autobiography, basically. And, um, Rollins's friends were aghast that he had been basically left out of Grant's memoirs. Um, and that leads us into a whole other topic that uh, I address in the book. But uh, the other point that our questioner made, I think is a good one. And uh, that is, I'm of the opinion that Grant was very tired of hearing about how Rollins was his better half and had, uh, uh, had been responsible for so much of his success. And Grant heard this. This stuff was coming out uh, the day after Rollins died in the newspapers. And I think Grant wanted to make sure that his leg in his in his autobiography, and, and really that was his legacy. That was gonna be the last thing he'd ever do. He wanted to make sure that he stood on his own two feet. And uh, if you're a little bit familiar with uh, Grant's memoirs, there was a, another person from his staff by the name of Adam Badeau, who, um, who was skeptical about whether Grant could write or not. And Badeau had kind of thought that, well, he could sneak in there and basically be Grant's ghostwriter and do the writing for Grant. Grant wouldn't have any of that. This was Grant's time to stand on his two feet. And, and he expelled Badeau from this, from the writing. Uh, Badeau later sued, by the way. So it's a great question. And, and there's more detail in the book about that too. There's a lot in the book that uh, people just have to uh, 
pick it up and read. Uh, yeah, I hate to say it. And uh, probably another book is in, in process. Well, maybe? I don't know, not yet. <laughs> uh, the Rollins book kind of weighed in at 600 pages. So uh, when I say there's more in the book, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming up to the end of our time. Is there is there one more question anybody has? Um, well, I tell you, the book is in the library, but checked out. And so uh, please put it on hold. And also uh, you will find copies of it at the Elm Street Bookshop uh, in town. Al, thank you so much for being with us. I'm very sorry. My deepest apologies for our uh, technical issues, but you carried the ball and I thank you. Hey, no problem. Uh, there's always seems to be a gremlin in the uh, technology works, it seems. But thank yes. you for persevering. I appreciate the, the questions. They were excellent. And, and having had the chance to chat with uh, one of uh, the Rollins uh, yeah. relatives, yeah, I mean, that's special. I really appreciate that. That and, is great. And I'll tell you, if uh, Mr. Manning uh wouldn't mind if he it, you know he might give see if he asked mr manning if he'd pass his email on to you I, I, okay I, all and, right so, I, i'll be happy to take it um here my name is laura cavers if Please, uh, uh, appropriate. send oh let's see send it on to me and then i will let al know of it and he'll be in touch with yeah um, i'd i'd love yeah. to hear whatever family stories there are yeah, yeah. And, and also, while we're, we have one last minute, speak mm -hmm. with David Sheehan, um, uh, who was uh, Rollins' best friend. One of the things I was able to um, research was the diary that David Sheehan kept mm -hmm. when he was incarcerated in prison. Uh, for having uh, gone against Stanton's regulations. There's a story in the book about that. And I think I'm the only person who's had a chance to have that diary in his hands in the last many, many years. So that was uh, really, uh, really quite a treat for me to be able to see that. That is great. Al, thank you again. And right. to all the audience members, thank you for your patience sticking with us. Um, I look forward to seeing everyone at our next author talk. We have more coming up. Please check the New Canaan Library calendar. Thank you. Every Good evening yes. to all of you in New Canaan. Oh, you're very welcome. Good night, everyone. Thank Bye you. Now.